Hi, everyone. This past Tuesday, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, an 11 plus year effort to level the playing field for pregnant and postpartum workers became law. Federal protections were expanded for millions of people, thanks in no small part to many of the people you're going to see on this stage today. Due to the PWFA, employers must now provide medically necessary, reasonable accommodations to the nearly 2.8 million people who work while pregnant each year. Our partners at the National Partnership for Women and Families calculate that this will include nearly 75% of pregnant Black women, the largest demographic covered under the new law, nearly two-thirds of pregnant Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander women, six in 10 pregnant Latina women, just under six in 10 pregnant Indigenous American and Alaska Native women, more than half of pregnant women with a disability, and more than half of those who are economically insecure. A recent poll from the Bipartisan Policy Center found that 23% of mothers consider leaving their jobs due to a lack of reasonable accommodation or fear of pregnancy discrimination. This is a sweeping victory for those women who no longer need to choose between economic security or a workplace that won't provide them with these accommodations like additional bathroom breaks. We hope the pregnant Pregnant Workers Fairness Act will allow more pregnant people the opportunity to thrive as it is their human right to be able to do so. We also hope it will pave the way for many of the policy advances we need to see in order to advance gender and racial equity through more investment in family sustaining policies, such as paid family and medical leave, childcare, and other elements of the care infrastructure. Today, we're going to start our event with a fireside chat with workers who experienced discrimination and became advocates by sharing those powerful stories. That will be followed by a panel exploring how an unusual constellation of organizational partners pushing for change to help Congress get this important law over the finish line last December as part of the year-end funding law. We'll wrap up with an audience Q&A. We hope that this event is enlightening and we thank you so much for being here. Now I'm going to turn it over to Bridget Schulte, the director of New America's Better Life Lab. Bridget. Thank you so much, Julia, and welcome everyone. We're so glad that you're all here um, to have this important conversation. Um, as Julia mentioned, I'm Bridget Schulte. I'm a longtime journalist and writer and the director of the Better Life Lab, where we really lean into the power of story for narrative and culture change. Uh, and that's what we're gonna talk about in this first panel. Uh, you know, As the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act um, the 10 year journey that it took really to become law and the role that story played in sharing stories. So what I wanna do is I'd love to open it with you, Lindy. Um, my very first uh, uh, encounter, if you will, with the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act and pregnancy discrimination uh, was uh, back in like a 2014. I was uh, at an EEOC hearing and completely uh, it, it was, it blew my mind. It's like, these were not stories that were uh, in the newspapers. We didn't really know a whole lot about it. Uh, there had been this 1978 Pregnancy Discrimination Act and I guess everybody figured it was done. We figured it out. Um, and I ended up writing a story about you. Um, uh, and I, I suppose I should do this before, I, you know, uh, I'll introduce the panelists as I bring them in. So um, you know, Lindy, you are a Kentucky police officer. You're also a, a, a better balanced community advocate. Uh, and so I'd love to bring you in here. Tell us, uh, tell us your story and, and why the pregnancy, you know, Pregnant Workers Fairness Act is so important to workers like you. Yeah, yeah, and thank you. It was the very first story that, that was written about me. And, and it was long, I think nine years ago now. So it's a... Um, a lot of progress since then, but um, in 2014, I was pregnant and working as a patrol officer in my city, and I was pushed off the job when I requested light duty, um, when just the, the, the physical strain became too hard on my body, it became unsafe. Um, once I requested that light duty, it was denied to me. There was a citywide policy that nobody could work with any restrictions at all. Um, they also told me at that time that I wouldn't have health insurance by the time I delivered. Um, and it was a very difficult and complicated pregnancy. So that added stress um, was really terrible. And just the, the emotional stress and the financial stress on my family because of that was just really awful. 
you know, so um, it, what ended up happening? You know, I know in the story that we we sort of left, and you were worried about losing your health insurance, and you did mention the the stress. You know, um, what what it ended up, ended up happening? Um, you know, it certainly made your pregnancy much more difficult. You'd also run out of unpaid family uh, unpaid leave, um, so mm-hmm. uh, you know you wouldn't have any time to recover. Uh, after giving birth, what what happened then? Um, in during my pregnancy, I contacted a Better Balance, so they were um, so so helpful for me through the entire process. I, um, yeah, I can't. I really can't stress that enough. But I um, stayed working there. I uh, finished my pregnancy. My son passed away a couple hours after he was born. And then eight weeks later, I returned to my job um, because, like you said, I didn't have I didn't have that time accrued. I needed to be at at my job and making money. I'm so sorry, and I'm so sorry to hear about your you know, passing away. You. you know, to you know, a stressful and difficult time that you didn't even have time to to grieve for. Right. Um, you know, so um, Natasha, let me turn to you, and and Lindy would also like to have you have you comment as well. You know, Natasha, t- can you share your story? So let me introduce you as well as I bring you in. Natasha Jackson, uh, she lives in South Carolina. She's a mother and a, a better balanced community advocate. Um, and you lost your job and ultimately your house while you were pregnant uh, when you requested light duty and flexible hours. You know that just seems so completely unreasonable and so punitive. Can you can you tell your story? And then I'm going to ask both you and Lindy to reflect on, you know, why you decided to become advocates and 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 speak out uh, about this. Sure. Um, I was working at a local rental furniture store. I had been there a little over two years at the time that when I found out I was pregnant. Um, the store was all male. And I was the only female there. So I was already hiding the pregnancy because I was uncomfortable. Um, but after a while, you can't hide it. And I asked to uh, have a short schedule change, like maybe an hour difference because I had severe morning sickness. I wanted to come in like an hour later and I stayed an hour late um, to make up that time. At the time, I thought that that was going to go through OK. But once it got up the ladder to, to the district manager or whomever, um, I just remember being put on a conference call in HR and some management. One of them told me to go get a job working at a grocery store, bagging groceries somewhere. Um, I just re- just remember, I just had this feeling like this isn't right. Why should I have to go get another job? And I can't be where I've been for two years just because I'm pregnant. Um, I cried for help by like putting my story on a blog at the time which uh, led me to meet the guys at A Better Balance and NPR did a story. And I just kept telling the story, even though I didn't receive any help. At that time, I had two kids already. Um, I was married, but because of the financial stress and everything that was going on with, once I got put out the job, I ended up uh, backing out on buying a house because we didn't have the income. I eventually ended up homeless and divorced all because there's one day of being pushed out of work because I was pregnant. You know, it just sounds unbelievable. And both of these stories happened at a time when there was something called the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. You know, so Natasha and Lindy, can you talk a little bit about why you decided to become active, why you decided to share your story and, and what the, what's that meant along the way? Um, I... I won't lie that I was very hesitant to at first. This is not my comfort zone at all. Um, but I also really trusted the people at a better balance and they explained they explained the importance of storytelling. And they explained that if I, you know, really wanted to try to affect change in my city, that this was going to be necessary. And they were a thousand percent right. I truly believe if if I hadn't shared my story. If I hadn't put, you know, a face on the story or a face on this issue, that this the policies would still be in place and they would still be hurting people in my city. Wow, thank you for that, and Natasha. What about you? I agree with what um, Lindy said, and I, um, 
I just, like I said, I knew something wasn't right. I have daughters. I have two daughters. Um, one now 20 years old and one 11. And I couldn't imagine them having to go through what I went through because you decide to start a family or want to, you know, you become pregnant and you're told you can't work. And I just felt like I had to keep talking. I had to keep telling somebody because somebody would listen. And eventually it led to meeting the president and this bill being passed. And even though at the time I wasn't helped or compensated in any kind of way, I'm just glad that I'm able to help other people. And I have people come to me now. And I just, before the panel, got off the phone with uh, someone who's pregnant. She works at a T-Mobile store um, and they were giving her some static and she's pregnant with twins and it's her first time and they're making her uncomfortable. So just to be able to talk to her, uh, let her know that this bill passed on Tuesday or took effect on Tuesday and what she could do and for her to find comfort in that. So like, oh, I'm gonna stand up for myself and I'm gonna do this and do that. That's the purpose of me telling, telling my story so it can help others. Love that, that's so powerful. Well, Dina, let me bring you in at this point. So Dina Bax, she's the co-founder and co-president of A Better Balance. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful uh, leader and partner in, in this work. And, and Dina, you and I were the ones that were talking when I was still at the Washington Post uh, and you brought me Lindy's story. And I had a difficult time getting into, into the newspaper. Um, we ended up putting it in the health section, <laughs> um, you know, trying to find a place for it. But can you talk a little bit about, you know, both Lindy and Natasha are talking about you know, these really horrific and, and almost mind-blowing stories of, of what, what pregnant women, pregnant workers were going through. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Why stories were important and how you, know, how you thought about them as you began this journey of trying to get this, this new law passed? Sure, <clears throat> thanks Bridget and Lindy and Natasha. It's so great to see you both. And I just really have to say that your bravery and commitment to sharing your stories um, over the years, along with many other women, has, has truly been instrumental to passage of this landmark civil rights law. And it's just been a total honor and privilege to work alongside you both. And um, it certainly kept me going during, you know, difficult moments in this journey, um, just sort of remembering what we we're fighting for. But I mean, yeah, this, this movement has been grounded in the lived experience of workers like Lindy and Natasha. This has never been a policy solution and sort of a problem. Uh, you know, back it, we were hearing from workers who, with just egregious examples of mistreatment at work, who are being denied water bottles and, you know, at work and wound up in the ER uh, due to dehydration, or, you know, a care worker, um, pregnant care attendant who submits a doctor's note with a lifting restriction and immediately sent home and then at 17 weeks pregnant, you know, winds up and moving into a shelter. And, you know, this was really outrageous. And what we were really wanted to be able to do was provide immediate support to women in this situation so they could protect their health and keep their jobs. But the way the law was structured, we couldn't do that. And it was just really frustrating because, you know, workers with disabilities were entitled to that immediate support. And also just frankly, it was just so easy to do. And yet women, the economic consequences were so devastating um, for, for the women um, that we were talking to. So, you know, in terms of the power of story, I, you know, I did, I wrote this, this op-ed in 2012 that I think inspired um, other women to come at me. And there were just countless other stories that came out after that op-ed, but it also led to, you know, an awakening in Congress to say, hey, wait, you know, this is a, a this is a problem that we need to solve. Um, you know, I remember, you know, Congressman Nadler, you know, immediately along with other members of Congress really jumped to saying, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna fix that. Um, and so, we knew that this wasn't gonna pass overnight in Congress. And so we really moved our work into the states and working with truly a wonderful and diverse set of partners nationwide, um, worked to pass pregnancy accommodation law state by state. And we won bipartisan support in 26 states. So we recently released this report um, called Winning the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. And we lay out some of the history and what we believe, um, what some of the key tactics and strategies were to passing 
this um, legislation. And, you know, I would say the power of story really comes up in every one of these tactics, right? I mean, our number one tactic, I would say, is for this conversation to, on this panel is, you know, center worker stories. With respect to Lindy, Lindy started her journey, you know, first by speaking out in her own legal case. Then she became a key voice for the Kentucky Pregnant Worker Fairness Act, and that bill passed with overwhelming bipartisan support. Um, and notably, in Congress, she then, you know, she, her story was shared by Republican lead, a uh, Republican lead sponsor, Bill Cassidy, who, who shared her stories multiple times to try and garner Republican support. Similarly, Natasha, you know, his voice was hugely influential in the passage of the South Carolina PWFA. She testified, she wrote op-eds, same with Lindy, testified, wrote op-eds, um, and then ultimately members of Congress. And then I think about Armand Allegros, who, um, you know, was pushed out of her job as a um, armored truck drive worker in New York City and wound up also becoming a tireless advocate for the PWFA. But Congressman Nadler, you know, has said over and over again, and especially at the bitter end when we thought this bill might die, like we need to do this for Lindy, for women like Lindy. So it mattered to members of Congress, you know, it mattered to sort of moving the needle and, and changing hearts and minds and explaining through the worker story, we were able to make the legal health, maternal health and economic case for the PWFA that grounded my initial thinking in the op-ed, but really it's been developed over the years, um, but that is truly all derived from worker stories. And the last thing I'll just say, Bridget, on this is that, you know, worker stories didn't just help us convey the need for the law, but it also helped us illustrate to lawmakers um, its effectiveness, right? Because I said, we didn't pass this bill overnight. We worked state by state. And I'll never, like New York City, when New York City's PWFA passed in 2014, we immediately used that law to help a woman named Floraba Espinal, who worked at a Bronx thrift shop, who was forced out and, you know, who was basically sent home without pay indefinitely because she asked for a chance transfer because she was at heightened risk of miscarriage, right? Citing the New York City PWFA, she immediately got her job back. Um, so we shared stories like hers with state and federal lawmakers, as well as with business leaders across the country to show that a statutory fix can help provide the clarity that employees need that helps keep them healthy and that employers need to keep you know women healthy and attached to you know pregnant and postpartum workers healthy and attached to the workforce yeah thank you so much for that dina you know it's uh you'd mentioned the uh, the report that you just put out i was just going to put a little psa here well it's backwards but it's yeah winning the pregnant workers fairness act it's amazing i, I printed it out which was a mistake because it's a it's a it's huge but it's great. Um, and, and it really does talk about the power of lived experience. So Lindy and Natasha, let me just go back to you with your stories. Cause again, you know, I think that when this, you know, Dina, you mentioned your, your op-ed in 2012 that I remember reading in, in the New York times pregnant and pushed out of a job and really being shocked, shocked that this was happening. Um, you know, Lindy and Natasha, when this was happening to you at the, at the time, um, you know, did it did it also bring that sort of sense of shock? Like, well, wait a minute, I, I want to keep working. I need to keep working. I can keep working with some reasonable accommodations. Why is this so difficult? You know, what were you know? Can you talk a little bit about that? I was shocked. Yes, I, there are there are female police officers all over this country. Um, most, uh, you know, not all, but most departments have some type of policy in place. To, to keep everybody safe. It wasn't safe for me to be working on the road for as long as I was. For me, my baby, my coworkers, none of us, it wasn't safe. Um, and it actually was Dina's op-ed that um, kind of led us to her. My sister found it and reached out and just, just said we need help and Dina responded right away. And, um, but yeah, I was, I was completely shocked, absolutely. What about you, Natasha? I was definitely shocked, um, but then it helped me to realize that this was actually the second time that this was happening to me. I want to state that because that played a vital role into me actually wanting to tell my story. Um, when my very first child, I was working at a pizza hut and I was hiding my pregnancy. 
I was young and I needed to work and um, my stomach began to show and I came in one day and they, they told me that I had been terminated and they wouldn't give me a reason why. And I was still doing my job and doing everything coming in on time. And so once this happened again, a light bulb went off like this just isn't right. Um, so I was more or less angry and wanting a solution um, because I just felt like this, this, this can't be happening again. And at that time I wind up living with people and I had a rough pregnancy. I almost delivered early when I wasn't supposed to be, you know, delivering yet. So there was this whole thing the second time where I'm not going to just sit back and let this happen. I have to tell somebody and I have to find somebody who's going to listen and I have to figure out a way that this doesn't happen to other people. You know, Dean, if I could bring you back in here as well, you know, and Lindy and Natasha, please jump in as well. And, you know, I sort of mentioned this in the, at the, at the sort of the top of our session here, I, there had been this 1978 pregnancy discrimination. I guess most people thought that we'd solve the problem. You know, did you run into that kind of pushback? It's like, well, you know, why do we, why do we need this? Why do we need something additional when we have this other act? And was, you know, and how, what role did story play in helping people understand? It's like, well, there is that law, but it's super complicated, you know, because that's one of the things that I found. It's that, you know, being able to explain that really complicated law and why it, it didn't always work. Sometimes the people's eyes would glaze over. What did, what did you find, you know, in, in terms of, of saying that that wasn't enough, we needed more. Right. <clears throat> so certainly the power of story here was so, so important. Look, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act provides crucial protections to workers who face blatant pregnancy discrimination in terms of hiring and firing and, and their terms of conditions of employment. But the law has proven limited, particularly for women in low wage, physically demanding job, especially women of color, who I said earlier, need immediate relief to remain healthy and on the job. And this was what was so frustrating to me, the idea that you need to litigate and muster evidence of discrimination to prove somehow worthy of an accommodation as basic as like light duty or an hour schedule change or extra bathroom breaks. It just, it seemed that formal, that formal approach to equality wasn't working for the women that we were hearing from. And yet there was this widespread perception that it, you know, was good enough, um, that we needed to maybe just do more some more education, or maybe workers were confused about what their rights are. But fundamentally, I, I really believe that the framework wasn't meeting the needs of, of millions of, of women, and particularly, and as I said, in low wage and in male dominated jobs, who needed immediate relief. And I would, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it was interesting, the Supreme Court case Young versus UPS came down in 2015. And there's this idea, you know, and that we were, we were for a long time saying over and over again, you know, we need the PWFA and cited stories of women who, who needed this immediate support. But, you know, all this, the, the public conversation shift, shifted to the Supreme Court decision and folks were hopeful that the Young would, would help clarify and, and help you know, offer more support for workers in need of accommodations, but, you know, that did not happen. And in fact, you know, it created more confusion, um, more challenges for workers. Certainly, I'm sure you'll hear from the chamber, certainly confusion for employers about what rights and their obligations were. And so, you know, at A Better Balance, we started tracking these cases because there was this sort of political lack of political will at that moment to move the PWFA. It was this idea like, oh, think young, that was the win, fix the problem. But like we knew, I remember in 2016, I wrote a US news piece like days after that decision saying young is not enough. We need clear affirmative rights for, for women, especially in these low wage, physically demanding jobs in order to truly guarantee equal treatment um, for, for pregnant and postpartum workers. But in 2019, so we were tracking these cases and we, we realized that at that point we published the data that showed that two thirds of pregnant workers were losing those cases in court regardless. So it was, you know, not only was the standard flawed, but even under that standard, women were losing their cases. 
And um, that, I think that data, I think lit a fire um, under members of, you know, really became like, I think was, um, became really apparent that, you know, it was time for a legislative fix. And, you know, I think within the year, you know, there was or months, I think later, there was a, our first congressional hearing in 2019 on the PWFA, um, where we really talked about the limitations in both the PDA and the ADA and centered worker stories about why we need a legislative fix. Um, and so, the, you know, I, I would say also, you know, another pivotal moment came shortly thereafter when the U.S. Chamber came on board. Um, you know, our years of working in the states and working with business leaders and garnering their support helped us prepare for those negotiations with the Chamber. But it's important to note that workers' lived experiences really informed those negotiations on, from our perspective, too, both in terms of understanding what would really be feasible um, you know, it's not just words on paper, but like really thinking about how whatever, um, you know, off, uh, language we were offering or whatever our compromises were, were willing to make, like how that would impact real workers and how this would really, what we, we were on, we never wanted to compromise the integrity of the bill. Um, and fortunately we didn't, but it, it, it was really, I would just wanted to put a pin in, it also influenced our thinking in negotiations with business and, and ultimately played such a huge role in passage of, of the bill in Congress. All right, thank you for that. And just because we're talking about story, Peggy, uh, the, the Young versus UPS, the story behind that, which I, I also was able to write about when I was at the Washington Post is Peggy Young um, worked for UPS and um, when she became pregnant, her doctor asked her not to have to lift heavy boxes and make heavy deliveries um, for a certain short period of time. So she asked for light duty and she was, you know, refused. Um, even though at the time there were other, you know, guys who, you know, had back problems or herniated discs and they did get light duty. So all sorts of unfairness sort of baked in and, you know, they set the standard with all of that. Let me ask one last question of all three of you and then we'll move on to the next panel because I, you know, I want to be mindful of time. And I know this is such a rich conversation and I'm, I'm grateful to all of you for sharing all this, your stories, your lived experience, uh, you know, and this, and this wisdom. Um, but, you know, here we are, it's a day where uh, the Supreme Court has overturned uh, affirmative action. Uh, we're one year after the Supreme Court has overturned a 50 year settled law of uh, reproductive justice and reproductive rights for uh, for women. Uh, uh, we are um, in the middle. Of, we are uh, one of the uh, few countries, uh, advanced economies that don't have any kind of paid family leave. Um, we have unpaid leave, which uh, the research shows leads to more inequality because really the only workers who can use unpaid leave tend to be the people who are in higher wage jobs, where there's usually an employer provided paid leave. We don't have, uh, if you look at uh, comparisons of uh, advanced economies on how much we invest in care infrastructure like childcare or home care, we are really at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, meanwhile, we have families who are really suffering. Um, we haven't raised the minimum wage uh, you know, federally um, since about 2009. Um, so families are struggling. Uh, you know, we need more not only family supportive, but really family sustaining policies, um, public policies, workplace practices. So I guess the last question I want to ask all three of you is to reflect on like what what can we learn uh, from your experience, from sharing story, the power of story, uh, from this kind of journey and this fight for pregnant the you know pregnant workers fairness act. What can we learn? Uh, to move forward, to kind of move the care movement, care conversation forward so that we really can help more families, more and bring more equity at, in our uh, work, work and care, uh, you know, the, the, I want to call it justice because uh, we, we need a lot more justice when it comes to work and care in this country. What, what I would love to turn it over to the three of you. I learned that the battle isn't over just because the bill went in effect on Tuesday and there are some changes being made. However, there's still a whole lot of work that needs to be done. So I'll never stop telling my story. I'll never stop talking to people. 
I, this whole experience has made me teach myself about other laws and get involved in other things. Like you said, here in South Carolina, the minimum wage is still at $7.25 an hour. So if an employer is giving you 10 bucks, they feel like they're doing you a favor and they're not. Um, so I learned that we must keep going. We must keep fighting. Thank you so much, Natasha. Lindy, Dana, I'd love to have yeah. your final, final thoughts. Yeah, just looking back, because um, I've thought about a lot today, just about where this all started. And the biggest takeaway for me is that um, this, just me telling a story, all I wanted was policy change in my city. I did want it for myself, but I also wanted it for women coming after me. Um, and thankfully that's been rectified. There's been many healthy pregnancies since then. Uh, they were all treated very well. So that was really important. Um, but then seeing how that led to the Kentucky Pregnant Workers Bill and then years later, uh, now federal laws, um, that really solidifies the importance of storytelling to me, that this started with me as something very, very small. And it has grown into something that I honestly never imagined <laughs> that it would grow into, honestly. So. That's really inspiring. That's great. Dina, I'll give you the last word. Yeah, so inspiring. I'm just hanging on to what they both said. They're just awesome. Um, I mean, I, I mean, provide some hope um, that, you know, in some really, <laughs> difficult times facing women and families with so much more to do um, that we could pass um, a major civil rights bill um, at, you know, a solution to a real problem, um, you know, makes me think that there are pass forwards, you know, that in for other, you know, very important issues that need, you know, you know, congressional action at ASAP. Um, and that, you know, rooting issues and the lived experiences of workers. I mean, I again, I would just say that our best, you know, having the discipline to tell the stories in a way that illustrate your most effective policy arguments is really important. Um, but when you do that, um, it's incredibly powerful. And I think stories, you know, transcend politics. They I mean, have the power to unite us as humans. <laughs> um, they really elevate this to a moral level, um, all of these issues. And so that gives me hope that, you know, more is possible on the horizon. Well, Dina, thank you so much. It's, it's you know, I'm a big believer in the power of story. It's one of the reasons why one of my favorite quotes, it's uh, anonymous. I'm not sure who said it. Uh, but it's uh, the shortest distance between two people is a story. You know, we know that lived experience is often what it takes for people to uh, learn or change attitudes or behavior, but that's a big ask to have everybody have, you know, their own personal experiences. So story and seeing ourselves in other people uh, can be a powerful way to, to, to push change. So Natasha, Lindy, Dina, thank you so much. Uh, for sharing your stories, your wisdom, and your insight. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Vicki Shabo. Uh, she's, um, uh, she's one of the fellows here at the Better Life Lab uh, and has been really uh, a real uh, powerhouse in, in these uh, gender and work family justice issues for quite some time. So Vicki, over to you. Thank you so much, Bridget, and um, Natasha, and Lindy, and Dina, of course. Uh, what a what a terrific panel. Thank you so much for sharing your stories and your wisdom. And I think we're gonna pick up a lot of threads here and add to the conversation. We'll do that for about 40 minutes and then we'll have some time for Q&A uh, at the end. So my name is Vicki Shabo. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a senior fellow here at the Better Life Lab. Um, and it's been my pleasure to work with all of the organizations that we're about to talk to um, over many years in all sorts of gender equity and workplace fights and campaigns. Um, I am going to introduce the panelists and then we're going to dig in. I never know the best way to do this, whether to introduce everybody all at once or whether to go one at a time. But in order to have a free flowing conversation once we get to the panel, I think I'm just going to read quick bios for everybody and then we'll jump right in. 
So first we have Vanya Laville. She's a senior legislative counsel at the ACLU's National Policy Advocacy Department. And she's served as the organization's chief lobbyist and chief campaign strategist for women's rights and disability rights. She's led several successful legislative campaigns on behalf of the ACLU, including the Pregnant Worker Fairness Act, the Pump for Nursing Mothers Act, which passed at the same time, again, after a long fight as Pregnant Worker Fairness did, and abortion rights for women in the military. So Vanya, thank you. And I know some your technology might, uh, might cause challenges, so we are happy to have you with us and, and we'll figure it out. Um, uh, next, Mark Friedman is Vice President of Workplace Policy at the US Chamber of Commerce. He was closely involved in the chamber's efforts in drafting and promoting the Pregnant Worker Fairness Act, and he handles the chamber's response to paid leave and other labor and workplace issues. So Mark, thank you for being here. We've done one other event on this platform together before, and it's great to have you back. Um, next, Emily Martin is the Vice President for Education and Workplace Justice at the National Women's Law Center, and she leads the center's programmatic efforts to advance gender justice at work and at school. She's helped craft the initial, she helped craft the initial Pregnant Worker Fairness Act in 2012 and has been deeply engaged in legal and policy advocacy to advance the rights of pregnant workers for over a decade. Um, so thank you, Emily. And we've had the pleasure of running into each other multiple times in the last week. And so that's super fun. Same with Sarah um, here. So Sarah Brofman is National Policy Director at A Better Balance where she works to expand policies around the country that ensure workers don't need to choose between caring for themselves and their loved ones and their economic security. She's grateful to have been a leader in the advocacy efforts that led to the passage of the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act and state level PWFAs. We're gonna talk more about that in a little bit. And last, but certainly not least, um, Stacey Brayboy is the Senior Vice President for Public Policy and Government Affairs at the March of Dimes where she leads the organization's development and execution of federal and state government affairs and public policy agendas. Stacy oversees a nationwide team that advances legislative policies and external advocacy efforts. So as you can see, we have a panel with an incredible array of experience um, coming from different places, all of which uh, led to the passage of the Pregnant Worker Fairness Act. And I think that's one of the most remarkable things about this effort was how broad and diverse the coalition was, for how many years the coalition stuck together, how different organizations came from different places and added to the effort um, and ultimately led to a historic law that will affect um, up to 2.8 women, million women per year, estimated, estimated 2.8 million women a year. So um, we're gonna do this panel uh, sort of initial questions. We'll have some time for back and forth. Um, as a group, we, really had a nice uh, conversation in preparation. And so would love to recreate that here because I think it just yielded a lot of really, really interesting insights. A lot of us have been talking for years and years and I think we maybe all learned new things in our prep call. So we're gonna endeavor to do the same thing here. Uh, we wanna talk about what lessons came from the Pregnant Worker Fairness Act and how we can build on this for more passing more family sustaining policies. So Vanya, assuming your audio is working, I'm gonna to turn to you first. Um, again, you're at the ACLU. So this is an organization that works across a broad range of issues that, and you have vast experience with grassroots engagement and mobilization, um, as does the organization. I wanna, if you can talk a little bit about how you were able to get buy-in internally and what contributions you're proudest of with respect to the ACLU's work on PWFA. And I'll just say as a point of personal privilege, I sat in many rooms with you over many, many years um, and every single time you brought up this bill. Uh, and so I know that this was a personal priority of yours and an organizational priority. And just tell us um, how you were able to bring your organization to the table to use its its power to pass help pass this policy. Well, thank you, Vicki. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh. Thank God. I'm in Florida and there are thunderstorms in the background, so I just never know what's going to happen. So bear with me. Um, yeah, so thank you. And thank you especially for convening us. Um, you know, most folks know I can talk about the PWFA, which, by the way, I call PWFA. Um, I can talk about PWFA for hours, literally. So, Vicki, yeah, give me some kind of flag if I go on too long. Um, I tried to write it down as much as I could. Um, you know, I've worked on numerous campaigns at the ACLU. I've been at the ACLU for 16 years. And, um, and this one was really special. It was incredibly grueling too, 
but it was really special and worth every gallon of blood, sweat, and tears that all of us, you know, put out there. Um, in, in terms of the question of how I got the ACLU to devote some resources to this, um, it's never easy to get resources from the ACLU. As you know, it's a multi-issue organization. I think there are like 80 of us constantly asking for resources to address everything that's happening in the states and in Congress. Um, and PUFA rose to the top, I think, you know, for a number of reasons, but I wanted to lift up three. One is um, I was able to point to a, a really diverse and powerful coalition, right? Like we had a lot of interests represented in that coalition and we worked together and stuck together for a long time. Um, you know, we often jokingly say, you don't often see the Chamber of Commerce, the ACLU, and the Conference of Catholic Bishops on the same side of any issue. You know, and I think that really resonated with the folks internally. So the coalition, I mean, pointing to our coalition really helped. Um, the fact that so many uh, red states had passed state PLIFA really made a difference too. You know, I was able to point to those states and say, listen, we can get members of Congress to support the bill because they have the cover. They have the cover that they need to support it because folks at home, you know, their own state lawmakers, their constituents voted and supported the bill. Um, so we thought we could really build Republican support that we needed to pass um, the bill. And the third thing I'd lift up, and again, there are lots of reasons I got the support, but um, the third thing I would lift up is what folks talked about in the previous panel, the story. Um, we were able to point to real people who wanted to work, who wanted to support their families and couldn't and Congress could intervene. But we also had the right kinds of stories, right? We had stories from rural America. We had stories from Alaska, or I'm trying to think if it's Nebraska, West Virginia. We had stories that could resonate with the Republicans who were trying to reach. And ultimately we knew we would get democratic support and this is all about how do we get Republicans to say yes. Um, but the truth is, I would not have gotten the $650,000 that we spent on PIFA if we didn't have a good House vote. Like we all knew, I knew, the coalition knew that first vote in the House of Representatives had to be good, it had to be really good. Couldn't have been just good or mediocre, it had to be really good. Um, and everyone in the coalition worked really hard, you know, from preparing for the hearing, holding the hearing, um, and all the activities that we undertook between, you know, I think all of 2019 and, and part of tw most of 2020 to get in a really good place for that September vote. And it was spectacular, right? PIFA passed by 329 to 73. And I think there was something like 101 or 103 Republicans who voted yes. I was always really great with these numbers. She has them at the top of my, her head. I always forget what the numbers are. But I remember it was like 101 or 103. And I think the entire Republican leadership voted for it. I mean, that's when we knew that this thing had legs. Um, and I knew we needed that. And once that happened, I was able to ask, you know, ACLU to open up its checkbook a little bit. Um, and you asked, like, what are the things um, that I am most proud of? And this is a really hard one um, because every department in the ACLU worked on, on this legislation, you know, development, legal, digital, calm, talent engagement, organizing, business development, like everybody contributed and, and tapped into um, their networks and the things that they do to get folks to support PWFA. Uh, so this is a really tough one. but. Um, I did want to highlight a couple of things. One is um, we hired a firm to do polling um, whose clients were predominantly Republicans. So a lot of the senators that we were trying to recruit like had hired this firm to do their own polling. And it was not cheap, but we knew we needed credibility among Republicans. And having a poll from one of their people that says PIFA is off the chart supportive and more folks would support than member of Congress if they supported PIFA, like that mattered. Um, so that was one contribution we made. Um, we subsidized the lobby day. 
Um, and the entire coalition worked on this lobby day, right? And it was tremendously successful. We flew in people, again, from red states. It wasn't just the blue states, but we flew in folks from Indiana, West Virginia. Yeah, West Virginia is still, still a red state. Um, you know, we brought folks in who could tell their stories. We had babies. We had T-shirts. We, you know, we really tried to create an esprit de corps and have folks talk to the members of Congress face to face. Um, and share those stories that we talked about in the previous panel. Um, the other thing I would say is that I thought was an important contribution was the engagement of our affiliates. I mean, this is something that, you know, the ACLU has that not many organizations have, but we have affiliates in every state. And that allowed us to tap into folks when we needed them. So when we realized that Senator Warnock and Senator Hassan were going to be really important, we realized it a little late, but we realized they were going to be really important. We were able to tap into the ACLU of Georgia and the ACLU of New Hampshire. Um, we were struggling to find that um, additional Republican co-sponsor. You know, the ACLU of Alaska, along with the National Wick Association, like put together this tremendous team of women who talked to Senator Murkowski's staff about the need, including someone who was in way rural Alaska. And I think that put the issue on her radar in a way that we hadn't done before. And literally a couple of days later, she said, I'm, I'm, I'm on board as a co-sponsor. Um, you know, there's the NYCLU in New York. Um, our, the director there has been there, I think, like 25 years. She knows Schumer. So we engaged her to engage with him periodically. Um, so I think our affiliate structure really helped at critical times. And the last thing I'll say, and I'm running out of time, the last thing I'll say is, you know, our organizing team and our digital team, again, I've been here a long time at the ACLU, and I don't think we've ever sent as many emails on one issue as we did with PWFA. You know, it was just a constant stream at different strategic points to tell people this is what's happening. Like, this is great, this happened. This isn't so great because Schumer hasn't brought the bill to the floor. And we encouraged people to call and to write and to make sure there was a steady stream of constituent engagement saying, you know, WTF, why hasn't PUFA passed yet? Um, and our digital team and our organizing team really led that work and made sure that PUFA remained kind of front and center. Um, and I'm gonna stop there. Sorry, I know I ran a little long. No, 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 you're, you're, you brought up so many different points, Vanya, I think that are important to this. I think just to give the audience some context in case they don't know, you mentioned the initial House vote that was overwhelmingly, strikingly bipartisan. Um, and I just wanna remind folks where we were when that happened, which was um, in the midst of an incredibly contentious political time uh, where almost nothing happened on a bipartisan basis, especially in the House. And so to just underscore how remarkable that moment was and how surprising, I think, especially to people who hadn't been following as closely, how surprising it was to have such an incredibly overwhelming bipartisan vote was really pretty incredible. Um, so just to, pro to provide that context for folks. Also, how long it took to get to the place where there was a hearing and there was um, there was movement on the bill, I think is something else for something that was supposed to be a gateway issue. A lot of us thought about it that way as a gateway to other bills or something that would be easier, a light lift. Um, it just, it took a lot of work and a lot of years. Um, and on that note, I'm gonna turn to Mark Friedman because one of the catalysts in moving things along was um, the ability to move the bill forward with the support of the U.S. Chamber and some of the other business and trade associations that came to the table. And so, you know, Mark, obviously, obviously having the Chamber and the business voice was critical, particularly in reassuring Republicans that this was not uh, not harmful and actually would be helpful for, for businesses to have a national, a national playing field and also just to have some uh, clarity. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what was most critical for catalyzing the chamber's engagement um, and what implications you think that has or what lessons are there for future policy fights and unusual that fellow coalitions. Well, thank you, Vicki, and happy to be with you all. Um, just a quick little note on that bipartisan vote. Um, some of us were sort of taking bets and having a pool as to how high the Republican count would get. Nobody had it topping 100. Um, you know, 50 would have been a victory. So we were in some ways, 
even more surprised and, and you know, that much more gratified that it came out the way it did. Um, what, what I'd like to focus on is, is, you know, how the bill came together and, and why we were able to support it. Um, the, the initial drafts of the bill were not really balanced. They didn't re reflect the employer's concerns and credit to just about everybody on this call, we were able to come to agreement on a bill that was a very balanced bill and solved the problem for the employer community. Uh, and, you know, Dina talked about the Young versus UPS decision. Um, I was quoted in a New York Times piece saying, I would defy anybody to read that decision and understand what the employer obligations are, and what the employee rights were coming out of that decision. It was a com complete model. Uh, and so, you know, employers are generally driven by a concern of avoiding litigation, and that Young versus UPS decision just looked like it was going to create more litigation. So if we could clear things up in the wake of that, we thought it would be a good thing. Um, and, you know, once we found a bill, once we came together on, on a version of this bill that we could support, we were happy to, to move it forward and, and do what we could to get it done. Um, you know, the final votes were a reflection of everybody's input. You know, Chuck Schumer isn't really going to worry about what the chamber thinks. Um, you know, at the same time, we were able to get Senator Cassidy and other Republicans to come on board and help them understand the nature of the bill. I will say, you know, the previous panel uh, talking about the power of stories certainly laid a great foundation. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's nice to be able to say I'm going to support a bill that's going to help people. and and you know, employers want to be on that side of the issue, but they also need something that works for them and in, in, in how they operate. And so this bill reflected both of those concerns and, and we were happy to push it forward. Great, thanks so much, Mark. And one follow-up, um, this came. This was like an interesting point that came up in our pre-conversation. So we've talked a lot about the state uh, the state victories, there's now 30 states in DC and five localities that have passed pregnant worker fairness bills. And from an organizing perspective, from a congressional perspective, this was a big deal. And Sarah and Emily and others will talk more about that. But interestingly, and it, interestingly, from your perspective, you were saying you weren't hearing very much from employers about that. And that wasn't as much of a factor. And I'm just curious if you can go into that a little bit, because on some of the other issues we work on together, like paid leave, I do know that the state's variation is a big deal. So if you can just reflect on that for a minute. Sure. Um, well, you, know, you raise a good, good issue and a good contrast. In the case of the pregnant workers fairness state versions, um, we were not hearing from companies about having difficulties working in the different um, states where these laws exist. Um, it's a much different playing field when you talk about the, the paid leave discussion and companies having to manage their paid leave programs within the different states and not being able to do something nationally. Um, the different state PWFA bills were clearly helpful, um, I think, as, as Fanny and others have said, in giving members of Congress certain cover um, for supporting a national bill that was similar to what they already had in their states. Um, we know that was the case in Kentucky, for instance. Um, and, you know, I know, I'm sure it played a role in some of the other offices that we talked to. Um, so there was value there. It just wasn't the same value that um, the question of different state laws in the paid family leave areas, um, it, you know, shows us. Super, super interesting. Um, we'll, I think, come back to this discussion in a bit. Uh, but I'm going to turn next to Emily, uh, where the National Women's Law Center anchored a lot of the work to build a data-driven case, worked really hard on the state laws, um, and works across a range of topics, both in DC and, and outside in state legislatures. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how polling and research played into this campaign and what other lessons you take from this work for the other issues that the Law Center works on, whether equal pay or pay equity, um, some of the education issues you work on, child care or others. Um, so I, I feel really lucky that I've been part of the Pregnant Worker Fairness Act uh, conversation since its first and earliest days back in 2012. Um, 
And as part of the National Women's Law Center's work to support and move this bill and uh, other bills like it in the States, um, we definitely over the years, including most recently in uh, the second half of 2022 and the final push, did polling, which showed, as Vanya described, the ACLU's polling showed overwhelming support around this issue across um, ideology. 97% of Democrats, 91% of Republicans said that guaranteeing accommodations for pregnant and postpartum workers was important. Those are really big numbers. Um, that is obviously not a bad thing in pushing for a policy change. Um, it's also not that unique. There's a lot of issues I work on that show overwhelming support, maybe not quite that high, but close to that high. When you talk about strengthening equal pay protections, for example, or um, making childcare more affordable and accessible. What I think was especially important in addition to the polling and related to indirectly the polling was the proof of concept that we were seeing in the states. Um, and so I get to think about the timeline a little bit. The Pregnant Workers Fairness Act was introduced in Congress in 2012. It was really the first bill that looked like this. There were some sort of limited state accommodation laws that had been around for a lot of years. California had passed a law not too many years ago. But it was sort of a moment that brought new attention to pregnancy accommodations. In 2014, the National Women's Law Center worked with advocates in West Virginia around the State Pregnant Worker Fairness Act, which was almost identical to the federal bill. Um, and not only did it pass, the first year it was introduced, it passed unanimously. And that was sort of a light bulb moment for us, for us at the Law Center, and I think more broadly in this work, that this is an issue that actually has incredible power that people don't want to vote against the idea of letting pregnant workers sit down if they need to during the day, um, that if you can get to a vote, you can, it is very hard to vote against this bill. And that is in significant part because of the power of stories, because this is a, a simple issue to understand, no matter where you're coming from. Um, so West Virginia 2014 passed unanimously. We worked in Delaware that same year and passed a pregnant workers bill unanimously with robust championing from both sides of the aisle. Um, the next year in Nebraska, we worked with a lawmaker who thought it was a message bill and it ended up passing unanimously. And so that proof of concept of the power of this issue to um, unite folks and the power of the stories to drive people, I think was an incredibly important lesson along the way. And what that taught us was that in Congress, if we could get to a vote, if we could get onto the floor in either the House or the Senate, that we were really optimistic about what would happen. And the work in the years that followed, 2014 and 2015, um, to our first House vote in, um, in 2020 was all about um, getting to that point of getting to the moment where people had to say yes or no. And the experience in Congress demonstrated the power of those stories and the power of um, this issue. And so what I take from it in thinking about other issues, which sadly um, have become more contentious and more partisan over the years, is that there are slices, there are pieces, there is potential to find the issue, to find the story, to find the policy solution that really does capture imagination in this way and that can unite people who don't necessarily usually work together. While it's not the same, I think about the work that has really, um, has really shown such momentum in the states in recent years about prohibiting employers from relying on salary history and setting your salary, which helps close gender wage gaps. And I think it's another example of, a, of an issue where people can see that in their own lives can feel the fairness of it and that can thus have a lot of power for policymakers. Um, and so that's the lesson that I take that both uh, that stories are powerful and that in a moment where it's really easy to be cynical about whether policy offers solutions in a place of deep 
divisive partisanship where it's really hard to move anything, but sometimes it's possible to make people's lives better that way. Yep, that is that is great um, and a perfect segue to Sarah. I think, yeah, what was I think what was so surprising and so interesting is the vote was overwhelming, the vote was overwhelming again, and then we waited for a really long time um, until we could get this bill across the finish line in the Senate. And Sarah, you were um, deeply involved in with others and convening the coalition and thinking about how different organizations could play different roles inside and outside um, in DC and states. And I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about uh, the coalition and how it came to how it came together, where there were, um, how it functioned and uh, what you think the greatest successes might be, especially those that are translatable to other efforts. Thanks, Vicki. Um, and it's a really exciting moment to be here with you all. It's PWFA week, the laws in effect. It's already starting to help people as we heard Natasha say, right, just before this call. So it's a really great moment to reflect. And I think if there's one word to take away about the success of getting the PWFA done, it's persistence. It's being relentless to get this bill over the finish line. There was no way it was not going to pass at the end of 2022. And that's for a lot of different reasons. And you heard Dina share and Lindy and Natasha share about the power of story. Well, that wove its way through everything that we did, everything that the coalition did, and it was critical. Um, that was front and center always, um, whether that be in ads, in digital um, campaigns that we were doing, everything permeated with that as the center. Uh, Vanya mentioned the lobby day, the ACLU and the coalition organized. We had a community advocate come to that lobby day. She spoke and shared her story with her legislator. He agreed to co-sponsor the bill on the spot because that is the power of story. And when it came to the coalition, it was also about knowing when to apply pressure strategically, respectfully, and firmly. Um, there were some really, and I think others have referenced this, it was grueling, it was taxing. There were some really hard moments where we had to think through what is going to be um, important in getting this, this bill across the finish line. And sometimes that means putting some pressure on our lawmakers because they have many different priorities. Our priority was getting Pregnant Workers Fairness Act passed, getting these protections in place for the pregnant people who we know needed them ASAP. Um, so that was our priority and we needed to make that very known. And we needed to make that known constantly, right? So just from a better balances perspective, like putting out reports constantly um, to amplify the issue and doing those in partnership as well, right? So we wrote a report with the Black Mamas Matter Alliance after doing a listening session with leaders from nine states, Black women leaders in nine states, um, talking about what this bill would mean to them, to their communities, um, and really lifting up the importance for lawmakers about the impact on Black maternal health that this, that this bill would have. So doing that constantly. At the end, we were putting out a lot, a lot of ads um, in a lot of different places, and a lot of us doing that. Vanya mentioned the ACLU of New Hampshire and Georgia, because those two states were really strategic, putting out an ad in the New York Times that a better balance took out. Um, and that was also in partnership too, because a lot of the women that signed that were from various organizations. Um, but that was the power of story as well, and, and where you amplify different stories. And then there were the many of us have mentioned this, but the coalition was very, very diverse. You had labor organizations, you had business associations. Also, we don't talk a lot about those two groups being on, on the same side of certain issues all the time, but they were as well. Civil rights groups, racial justice groups, faith groups, um, and maternal health groups, just so many different groups. And it, it wasn't just that and we calculated there were about 700 advocacy organizations that worked on PWFA over the years, but it was how you deploy different organizations um, to different 
key constituencies, um, meaning, you know, certain lawmakers don't want to hear from certain organizations, but do want to hear from other organizations. And so it's really important that they hear from many different messengers. It was very important for a lot of lawmakers to hear that the chamber supported the PWFA um, and that various religious organizations supported the PWFA. Um, that was really, really critical in this. And the same went for lawmakers on both sides of the aisle and many different kinds of organizations. Um, and so I think it was about uh, relentlessness um, of, of so many. Um, and then there were also, and it was, and, and I'll give another example too, like we probably did 20 sign-on letters, <laughs> maybe in just 2022 alone. At the end, by the end, we were like, do we need to keep doing sign-on letters? But we're like, Yes, if he didn't, if 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 they weren't going to bring it up this month, they were going to get another sign on letter from us, and they were not going to stop until they, you know, we were not going to stop until they um, they brought this bill because that's the other thing is until it happens, it hasn't happened, and so you have to rely on one another um, as a coalition to say until we see. President Biden signed that bill into law, we are continuing to keep pushing together. Um, and the last thing I'll say is on the states as well, um, the long overdue report that Dina mentioned um, was we did a ton of research around the young decision and the cases, but half of that report was actually looking at every state where PWFA had passed since 2012. Um, the first in that in that series was New York City, then New Jersey, then West Virginia, as as Emily mentioned, and on and on and on up to South Carolina, where Natasha testified twice, mind you, Tennessee, Kentucky, like we mentioned, um, and pulling quotes from. Republican and Democratic members, right? Delaware Colin Benini was the sponsor, Republican sponsor there. Amazing quotes from him that were incredibly helpful with sharing with Republican lawmakers. Um, and all of them passed with bipartisan and nearly unanimous support, if not unanimous support. Um, and that's just unheard of um, in so many places um, like South Carolina, like Tennessee, like Kentucky. Um, and you also really had Republican champions um, as well, right? And I really have to say in terms of Congress as well, you know, we, we had very devoted champions, um, probably because they heard from us so much, um, as well as really caring about the issue. But that was really critical. And that was the power of having all those voices descending upon them. So I'll stop Thank there. you so much, Sarah. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so one of those important voices was the March of Dimes and the data that you all had on uh, maternity care and maternity care deserts. Um, Stacey, as the leader of the maternal and infant health uh, sort of space, a leader in the maternal and infant health space, especially in research, talk a little bit about the annual reports that you share with offices of, Cong of, of Congress um, and how offices have relied on that in drafting bipartisan legislation. How did you use this data um, to drive the message to lawmakers and the media on the importance of passing pregnant worker fairness? So, so Vicki, let me first say thank you um, on behalf of March of Dimes for <clears throat> allowing us to participate um, today. And then also just thanking my, my fellow colleagues and panelists um, in celebrating this PWFA week and being able to get this act over the finish line and and definitely hearing Sarah's without, without calling names hearing everybody's comments and hearing the stories that were shared of lives that were impacted and how they became voices and advocates um it just it makes me proud to be a part of this coalition team it makes me proud to to share in the day let me just share that march of dimes because we advocate on behalf of moms and babies and because of our stance in terms of being uh nonpartisan um what we brought to the table as a part of uh the pwfa coalition is we look at our studies and we look at how um, we're able to show how accommodations, as simple as getting the extra bathroom breaks um, or being able to drink water, allow for repriving of standing all day could help prevent uh, premature births and low birth weights. We were able to show um, data that pointed to by allowing accommodations 
to birthing people and their babies will allow them to experience a range of more positive outcomes and would have a negative impact in some cases on miscarriages and, uh, and premature births. And so what we were able to do every year, March of Dimes reports a, we publish a routine, re routine publication, which is our annual premature birth report card. And in that report card, um, it details a summary of maternity care deserts, it rates states, it shows information for specific congressional, you could look at congressional states, not necessarily the districts, but you can look at your state. And you're able to look at what the letter, what your grade is, what the impact is, the impact of how it could affect someone that's in South Carolina, someone in Georgia or North Carolina. And we were able to share this data um, at, with the executive branch, with our legislative branches, um, as well as in our states about why it was important for us to have advocates talk to their legislators um, to get them to support PWFA. And let me just share that data and because of what we've done in terms of researching and being able to show the impacts of why PWFA would change the course of a person's life, a birthing person's life, we were able to demonstrate ensuring health, a healthy pregnancy, if it's at home or if it's at, if it, it's at work. Um, we were able to use that message and that message and that data resonated um, with congressional members it resonated with some of the bill sponsors. And I, we believe also helped to secure additional support from many congressional colleagues as well. So we were able to also not only utilize our report card, the data that was there, call out specific pieces and highlight that. We also participated in many interviews. Um, we placed op eds. Um, we did other interviews that kind of talked about why it was important to take action. Um, we did our own call to action so that we could get our advocates in that in the space to be able to call their members at the state and also at the federal level to promote the importance of, of PWFA. And so what we know by looking at the data at March of Dimes is that without accommodations, um, there the Birthing people and their babies may experience a range of negative health outcomes, and that is increasing um, the numbers and the data shows miscarriages and uh, premature and low birth, low birth weight uh, babies. So we believe um, having PWFA joining the coalition, being able to push forward was important to how we have an impact on moms and babies across the country. Thank you so and much. So Vicki, I will add, you know, having this, having, having this act, having this legislation passed and then having the president to sign it into law, it definitely does help with um, our current maternal health crisis that we face in this country. And so we know that there's an increase in terms of the numbers of deaths related to uh, pregnancy and negative outcomes. And so we believe and know that looking at the coalition between our data and what PWFA would do, and then also listening to the stories that were served, that were shared at the beginning of the panel actually solidifies um, why it was important for us to join the coalition and to join the fight and actually be here to celebrate um, the great work that everyone has been able to accomplish. That's amazing. Yeah, and hopefully success begets success. And I really appreciate what you said in terms of the tangible impact, particularly as we've just passed the anniversary of the Dobbs decision and the impact that that's had on people's choices surrounding pregnancy and childbirth, um, or lack of choices, as the case may be in many cases. Um, so I'm going to open it up now. I'm not sure if we're bringing back uh, the other folks that were on. Somebody can can tell me if we are or not. But um, we're opening up to Q and A's, um, but yeah, uh, you know, folks have said a lot of things here um, and I wanna give the panelists actually like a time to respond to each other because you all have worked so closely together for so long. Um, does anybody wanna to contribute, Vanya? I know you you had some thoughts that you wanted to share um, and I see we're bringing Dina back, which is awesome. Um, so Vanya, go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to say that, um, all of our issues have important stories, right? All of our issues, when we talk about childcare, we talk about paid leave, we all have stories. Um, 
So it definitely was a critical part of Pufa's passage. But there are lots of other pieces too, right? And I, I don't want us to convey that, you know, everybody has to go run look for stories, that stories was the heart of it. I don't know if stories was the heart of it. I think it was an incredibly important part of it. But there were so many other pieces of it um, that I think it's worth talking about. And, and the reality is I do think finding common ground with the chamber open doors. So I do think on the other issues I work on, I'm thinking, who's that voice I need to come along that hasn't been with us that might open a door? Like, How do I rebrand? I'm working on another bill I won't name, but how do I rebrand the bill so that it it opens doors that weren't open before, which I think the, the chamber helped do. Um, and again, the coalition, the diversity and the kind of complete commitment to showing up week after week and devoting resources and willing to make some tough decisions at different points. You know, there were times where our coalition disagreed on things. There were times we, we weren't all on the same page about how hard to push our friends. You know, the ACLU has this, well, folks at the ACLU love to say, we have no permanent friends. I don't love that statement. I think it's, I don't think it's nuanced enough, but this idea that, you know, the Democrats are our friends, they are, but they have to be held accountable too, which is what we faced towards the end of the year that almost doomed the bill. And having a strategy for that, um, you know, there's lots of different pieces, I think, that led to this um, and don't want to overhype stories, though they are, they are critical. Yeah, I, I was going to agree that I think that um, lots of pieces were important, including this a broad, diverse coalition that... Um, that came together with a lot of good faith. I disagree with Mark, the original bill was unbalanced, but I think that we were able to sit down together and have a good faith conversation about what their concerns were that was really meant to try to find solution rather than to sort of posture at each other across the table. That plus a willingness within all of the groups that were working together to respect each other's red lines and um, it's not as though there weren't internal disagreements about strategy and approach and moments of tension around those internal disagreements. But at the end of the day, I think there was a lot of mutual respect on each other's red lines, which made it possible for us to work together. Well, having been mentioned, I figure I'll just jump in here. Um, yeah, I mean, the bottom line was I think everyone came to the table trying to figure out how to come to agreement. Um, and as Emily mentioned, we were, you know, we had to respect each other's priorities and, and sensitivities. And I think we all looked at it in that light, but always with the idea of, well, we want to get to a solution here. I mean, let's just face it. The chamber didn't come to that table saying, we're going to blow this thing up. I mean, we came to the table saying, let's work. Let's figure out how we can make this work. Uh, we could easily just step back and just, you know, fought this or opposed it or done anything else we, you know, we could do. But we were in there and we said, we want to find a deal. Um, lots of different people came to the table in goodwill looking for that deal. And, and we found it. Um, it was it was pretty remarkable. I mean, you know, a lot of us have been around this town a lot of times and don't see those types of breakthroughs and this was this was a good one so we were happy to be part of it and um you know contribute to the overall success i'm going to take the point of moderator privilege here to ask a question which is so oftentimes in legislative negotiations there are starts and stops and sort of unusual allies coming to the table together um it feels like this one was very much on a trajectory of once you got to the table, you all kept going. 
And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit, and I think there might be different perspectives on this or maybe not, from Dina and Emily and Mark in particular, how did you know that it was time to be at the table, that there was potential to move forward? Um, and was there ever doubt or sort of a retrenchment in this long fight? Well, I'll just speak from the chamber's perspective. I mean, we looked at the bill and we, we thought at the end of the day, it's a good thing to have women stay in the workplace and help them get their accommodations. Um, you know, as I noted, there were parts of the original bill that we weren't crazy about and we wanted to figure out if there's a way that we could improve the bill and, and that would give us comfort with it and, and want to be on it. So the, the discussions ensued and, and, you know, we saw what happened. Um, it, I, I can't say that it was a great, you know, light bulb moment. We just thought this was a good bill that we should be able to work on and let's see if we can make progress. And I'd also add that it wasn't overnight. Like we had some initial conversations with Mark um, where they they were promising enough so that uh, we kept each other's number, but that didn't lead to much of anything. I, I, I think those conversations before the Young versus UPS decision that may have sort of muddied the waters further and shifted the chamber's calculus. But part of it was willingness to keep talking over the years, even when the first conversation was not terrible, but didn't lead to agreement. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would echo Emily. I think that's right. It was just an open and very much a good faith conversation and willingness <clears throat> to really hear what each, you know, the other perspective, others concern, you know, it's, it's very easy as an advocate to think you're right. It's a lot harder to genuinely think about and respond to the concerns um, of the business community and others. And I said, you know, we came to those conversations really prepared from negotiating with business groups in the states. Um, and so I just want to underscore the importance of preparation. Um, you know, Mike, Mark might not have understood this, but we, from his perspective, it was like, sure, let's talk from ours, you know, we wanted a strong bill, you know, but we learned, we, we knew already sort of where areas of misconceptions lied around sort of what the bill does or doesn't do, and we needed to be prepared to make the strongest arguments possible, not only to not gut the bill, but to actually go further than the ADA and offer stronger protections for pregnant workers um, because of the limitations in the ADA. And we knew that from the lived experiences of workers and you know, also the case law, of course. So, I mean, I, I agree. I think it was just you know, this really um, mutually respectful, good faith conversation that you know, wasn't, you know, seemed effortless, but required a ton of work and preparation. Um, to, I'm sure on their end too, to make sure that they were comfortable, but we were comfortable as well. I just and want to say one quick thing, oh, and I know Sarah wants to jump in, but I just want a quick moment of clarification. I hope nobody thought the chamber was coming into this to try and gut the bill, you know, that we were not looking for a way to, because clearly nobody, you know, on the other side would have supported that outcome. So we didn't think that was a feasible approach. We wouldn't want to see that. So we were looking for a way, and Dina, I think, expressed it well, to figure out where we could come to agreement, understanding each side's priorities. Sorry, I Sarah. think. Oh no, no, go. That was thank you, Mark. And I think we definitely felt that very in a very real way. Um, and just to underscore a couple of points that were made, and I think this also can be related back to worker stories, but in a kind of different way, which is that we knew where certain lines were because there were state level PWFAs that at ABB, for instance, we were already working with workers on helping them understand their rights under these laws, understanding how the laws worked and what, where we could be compromising at the federal level and where we really couldn't. And the bill maintained, I saw there was a question, um, so did the bill change based on these conversations? And the answer is yes, um, but from an advocate, advocacy perspective, um, it the integrity of the bill remained fully 100% intact. And in fact, there were some elements that 
and we're really strengthening. So um, because there was clarity, like Mark was saying, that was needed both for workers and employers in the bill text itself. But I think that piece about the that's not necessarily the the sharing of worker stories, but that's how worker experiences factor in in policy campaigns to craft really good, really strong policy. That's great, Sarah. Thank you. And that actually, we only have three minutes left. So I want to just do a quick lightning round of a question for each, each of you, if you want to answer, which is, um, what is the one kind of lesson or insight or aha moment you take from this fight that you think might apply to another fight? And whether that's a, a civil rights fight or a, an a income and security fight, a child care fight, whatever it is, um, what's the one thing you take from this? And I'm gonna start uh, start with with Stacy actually because we uh, you're first on my screen here. Uh, really quickly, agreed 100 percent what Sarah said, and I will tell you take the the takeaways for us is persistence, collaboration, um, and persistence again. Excuse me. Awesome, uh, Emily. I'm gonna go to you next. But winning is possible. You know, sometimes doing this work, it's hard to remember that winning is possible. And this is an important lesson, both for the specifics of what we achieved and for realizing that we can make progress. Awesome. Um, and uh, Sarah, you're next. Going back to the persistence, that is key. It's working hard. It's answering every question that is asked of you. It is not taking no for an answer up until the very last moment. And it's working through disagreement as well, really needing to stay at the table with everyone and build trust so that when those moments, those difficult moments happen, you can work through it for the good of the greater cause. Awesome. Mark? Um, I would say find the sweet spot. There are deals out there on just about everything that you've ticked off. Um, and there's a sweet spot there where all the parties can get together um, and it's gonna take effort. And it's gonna take swallowing hard and sometimes saying, oh my gosh, oh, oh my gosh, we were green. We didn't think we were gonna agree. Um, but find that sweet spot because when you do, as, as Emily said, success is possible. And, and I think people could be surprised at how much can be achieved if, if everybody comes and looks for that sweet spot. More to come on that for sure. Uh, Vanya, I'm going to go to you and then Dina, I'll leave it to you to close us out. Um, I would say come up with a pretty long. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. I would say come up with a really long menu of um, tactics. You know, we did some really interesting things with PWFA, um, you know, not just the lobby day and the digital act, but we did some other things behind the scenes that I thought were impactful and helpful. And I don't know if you can still hear me, but my screen is gone. We can, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> Dina, I'm gonna pass it to you um, for the last or second to last word. I mean, my colleagues just made so many excellent points. I just agree with, with everything that was said. The one additional point, you know, it was just really emphasizing the importance of value-based messaging. I think this idea um, that, you know, no worker should be forced to choose between a healthy pregnancy and a safe recovery from childbirth or pumping at work and earning a paycheck um, really, really resonated starting in 2012 up till today. And I think that, you know, it, um, we sometimes get you know, policy, strong policy arguments matter, story, a strong legal case matters, you know, being flexible, being nimble, being strategic, being relentless, that all matters. Um, but, you know, just keeping, you know, not forgetting the power of value-based messaging to resonate with people across, you know, the political spectrum. Super helpful. Um, Thank you all. So many more fights to come. Uh, we have paid family on medical leave to win. We have wages to raise. We have child care to provide. Vicky, 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 not fights, agreements. Agreements. I like it. We have common ground to find on all of these things that will strengthen economic security and bring equity for everyone and create a stronger economy. So Thank you so much uh, to the panel and to the folks who are out there listening today. Um, I'm sure any of us 
are here to answer questions that you might have offline. Uh, we have resources for you. I think we'll do a follow-up email and um, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.